Alright, so it's 2020. It's been one crazy year. We have bushfires, pandemic, murder hornets. But, you know, thankfully, we haven't had any demons. Oh, God! Oh, thank God. Just a piddly little red demon. Just a sad, small little red demon. Now, thankfully, there are no blue demons. <gasps> So yeah, 2020 is upon us, and what better things do I have to do with my summer than to give the calendar ideas on how to eradicate the entire human race? Uh, so yeah, Blue Demon. This is a movie that was made in 2004 about genetically modified killer great whites. What more do you possibly need to know? Basically, you can already tell this is going to be a masterpiece, true work of art of our times. And just uh, sit back, relax, buckle your boat seat belts, and we'll get into this classic. Like, oh, yeah, another thing to note, uh, this is free on YouTube Movies <laughs> with ads, so you can watch this right here, right now, after this video, because you want to watch this first. We didn't mean for things to go as far as they did, but in a world that's mostly covered with water, we needed a new kind of defense. Just another fish in the sea. Okay, so after that, the movie starts as you'd expect. Dumb college girls doing sorority stuff, uh, namely forcing one girl that they don't like to swim to and from a buoy, which they, they claim they didn't have to do, but they say the power is usually off and they, they knew where to cut the fence. Seems a little suspicious, don't you think? It seems suspicious. Also, I'm going to point out they completely rip the electric fence joke from Jurassic Park. Either way, a cop shows up while one girl's at the buoy, and the other three start making their getaway, while Mel is violently pulled under the water. Her friend is so distraught that she temporarily forgets how to show concern as her friend dies. As the new girl tries to save Mel, for some reason Mel's arm rips in half? Because, you know, physics. <laughs> Anyway, it doesn't matter because those weren't the main characters. The main characters, Doctors Nathan and Martha Collins, respect- There is a typo in the script. Her name is Marla, not Martha. ...are called up to their boss's office to explain their project is being defunded because- The fact that I have three hysterical college girls in the hospital right now. No, 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 let me rephrase that. I have three and a half hysterical girls in there. The divers are still trying to locate the rest of the fourth one. Which looks bad for the doctors because the sharks got out of their initial holding space but not out of the perimeter fence? Which their boss admits he's been intermittently shutting off the electricity from? And the girls trespassed on it by cutting the fence? I don't really see the liability here. I mean, don't get me wrong, this is exactly what happened happen in real life. Uh, even though they're the ones who trespassed and they did everything wrong, they would still sue. They would absolutely still sue. Probably the most realistic part of this movie, to be honest with you. They have to present some big results quick or lose their pointless jobs. So after they dump some exposition... I'm sorry, you don't consider genetically engineering a new breed of great white sharks results? Capable of living in either fresh or salt water, trained to recognize specific targets to defend? Larry asks if they respond to commands, to which they decide to show them the fruits of their labor. They've programmed the sharks to be able to follow commands, keeping them from eating the leg they threw in except for the obligatory rogue element, Red Dog. Not that you'd know which one Red Dog was, because they didn't make distinctive markings or scars or anything. Just minor movie elements, it's fine. But because Red Dog doesn't follow commands, Mr. Van Allen is not impressed and gives them a deadline. Yay, I'm sure they're very stressed. Where are the divorce papers because the writers couldn't manufacture meaningful drama with the store? Ah, there they are, of course. So Nathan doesn't put up a fight to get divorced, and he asks for the ring back, which, uh, logically, she goes to the dock to get soap to get it off. Why she wouldn't just go to a bathroom or a janitor's closet? I don't know. We then see the slowest sharks in the entire ocean. So she falls in, the guys rush over, and Avery shoots a literal air at the shark. Thankfully, these are the most mentally incapacitated sharks you could have possibly created. Riveting.
We soon cut to six weeks later, where the gang is presenting the sharks to a room full of government officials, including over-overtly militant patriotic general man who's super unrealistic but low-budget films think is a good idea anyway guy. I love all the things they do in this movie to stretch out that feature film time. What I'm about to say to you must be kept in the utmost. Who am I getting? It's completely natural. I need you to buy more. Cranberry pomegranate juice. This is a highly soft... kitty cat. Right, so Mr. General Man then explains that the sharks are part of a large plan to halt terrorists, because what else would drive an action movie in the early 2000s? For some time, we've been concerned about the possibility of a terrorist threat. Except the terrorists are using a Russian suitcase bomb? The Russian government informed us that it may have lost at least 100 of their so-called suitcase bombs, portable nuclear bombs, small enough and light enough to be carried in a suitcase. You just take the two biggest, most generic American fears and <laughs> crush them together into one big ball of convenient plot drive. Oh, also Martha decides this will be the best time to bring up something definitely tied to their romance. Could have just done it in, you know, the six weeks since the divorce was revealed to the audience, but no, I think she made the right call. So then the sharks are scheduled to show up, but as you'd expect, they're animals, and things are supposed to go wrong in this movie. So they get out of their holding place and head to the perimeter fence, where drunk, incompetent maintenance workers have left their walkie-talkie and entered the water. They're too late to save the poor diver, and on an unrelated note, watch an iron-rich underwater geyser go off. I've got six runaway sharks. Who would beg to differ? Actually, sir, they're swim away. They cannot run away, as they are, in fact, fish. If they were attempting to run away, this would be much simpler to... Do I look like I have my kidding face on? So, yeah, the general won't let Dr. Collins call the Coast Guard because it would lead back to the government, even though they could just say there were some great whites spotted in the area and leave the government out of it. I feel like there are easier ways to cover up a government secret, but apparently Mr. General Man disagrees because he literally jails up Nathan for trying to call the Coast Guard. This choice, of course, leads to the attack of an innocent fisherman whose daughter watches in horror as her father falls in with the huge sharks. Thankfully, these highly aggressive predators all decide that the bigger, thrashing, helpless human was in fact less appetizing than the clearly dead fish that gets thrown in the water with him. After this, we see Martha bringing Nathan some lunch, and oh my god, that's a gun. That's a gun. That's straight up, that's, you're about to straight up shoot a security guard. Oh! Marla, what the hell are you doing? Good news? It's just a dart gun. Bad news is, she still just shot that guy in the dick. I felt that on a spiritual level right there. Oh, mind you, apparently the dick is a passage directly to your heart and or brain, considering how quickly this guy falls over. Once she rescues Nathan, the two slink around suspiciously for no reason. Literally, the, the only thing guards even react to is how suspicious they're acting. Maybe yeah, this is how they get around certain places, I don't know. Are you hiding from someone? No, no, this is my house. Who are you? What are you doing in my house? So one more guard assault in broken harpoon physics later, Nathan tries to warn the Coast Guard about the sharks, but isn't taken seriously because he doesn't identify himself and makes it sound like an absolute lie. Why? Huh. Because... Because there are half a dozen government-grown killer sharks on the hunt along the beaches of this city, and unless your people take action right now, a lot of people are going to die. So instead, they decided it'd be easier to control the sharks from a laptop via radio than give the Coast Guard a legitimate reason to trust them. My name? Uh, that's not important. Damn bureaucrats! Yeah, bureaucrats are the problem here. What's important is that you need to send your boats out right now, armed with everything you've got. 
They evacuate most of a beach in time to blow up four of the remaining sharks, but as Nathan reawakens in the hospital, it dawns upon him that Red Dog is missing, which leads them to discover that Avery is a traitor who created a program to mask Red Dog's location. And the General reveals that he and Avery work together to sabotage the project. Avery for money and Remora because of... thinking the military was gonna get defunded into social programs? Because, you know, there wasn't enough terrorism as it was. So they had to manufacture t it makes sense. It doesn't make sense. Martha throws a life preserver at Remora, which, as you'd expect, completely baffles and disarms the war-hardened general. And they set out to find Avery's mobile lab, where they discover that Red Dog has the suitcase bomb and is on his way to blow something up. Nathan gets knocked out outside, however, and the chase ensues in the most time-filling, anticlimactic way possible. Once Avery crashes into the side of the road, they stop Red Dog from blowing up the Golden Gate Bridge, sending it back to base to completely obliterate the general. But apparently nothing else? Even though it's supposed to be an atomic bomb? Doesn't matter. It wraps it conveniently and quickly, and Martha reveals that what she kept trying to say is that she never filed the divorce papers, and they all live happily ever after. Or do they? Find out in Blue Demon 2, Electric Boogaloo. But no, they, they never made a sequel to this movie. What if they did? What if they made Blue Demon 2? Electric Boogaloo, 2020. It's not 2019. What if, what if it's based on a true story? What if it's out there, looking for you? Right now? Oh no. Look out behind you! Wow, it's been a long time since I posted. Hi there! Hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please consider subscribing and clicking that bell to know when I next post in the next 4,000 years. But no, in all seriousness, I really enjoyed making this video, and if you want more stuff like this, uh, please let me know by maybe leaving a like and maybe a comment. That'd be quite nice, so you don't have to. I'm not gonna force you.